Welcome to Plus One Four, the podcast powered by the Apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the Apocalypse engine. This episode continues our summer series about Firebrands games. I'm your MC, Rach. And I'm your co-MC, Rich. Tonight, we are joined by our guests, Tristan Willis and Pete Folk. Hey, Tristan. Hey, Pete. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Good to be here. Excellent. Well, we kick it off in this summer series, getting to know a little bit about what inspired you. So Tristan, how long have you been playing Firebrands games and what was your gateway? It's really interesting. Firebrands was actually my gateway into wanting to play tabletop role-playing games. Oh, wow. Um, Cool. Yeah. (laughs) I come to tabletop role-playing games through theater. Uh, I am a theater practitioner, divisor, playwright, performer. I... I've been really interested in how we make theater not feel dead in the room. I fall asleep at a lot of plays I've been at. uh, And at a certain point, it is not the audience's fault. (laughs) It's the (laughs) the play's fault. A few years ago, probably around, I want to guess like 2015, 2016, I started becoming really interested in tabletop role-playing games as a space where the audience is also the creator of the work Mm -hmm. and how that interactivity puts some responsibility on the audience in a sense for co-creating the story. So I started listening to actual play podcasts, one of which was Friends at the Table's uh, Counterweight season. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of that season, they play kind of a, a hacked version of Firebrands. And listening to it, I was like, oh, so tabletop role-playing games can be like this. This is what (laughs) TTRPGs can be like. I thought they were all numbers and rolling dice. And this was one that was a lot more focused on that relationship building. And of course, there are plenty of games that are, but it was my first real introduction to one that was really focused on relationship building between characters. So I read the Mobile Frame Zero Firebrands a ton. And that's when I was like, you know what? I actually want to start playing TTRPGs, and that's when I joined a group that Pete had been in for a few years already. Yeah. Fascinating. All right, Pete, you're up. How long have you been playing Firebrands games, and what was your gateway? Yeah, I have both a similar and different experience from Tristan. We are married, so like the, we, we are influenced by each other heavily, and so when they were first getting into Friends of the Table and Counterweight, I was listening in on the outside. And so I was exposed to it at around the same time, and I, I also really loved Counterweight, although Tristan has stayed longer with the podcast than I do. Sorry to the podcasters here. I don't make a lot of time for podcasts in my <laughs> day-to-day, so I just haven't had that same TTRPG podcast experience. But yeah, as Tristan mentioned, I've been in a Dungeons & Dragons group with my brother and a bunch of our mutual friends since probably 2015, 2016. And so I have that TTRPG experience. Mm-hmm. My Firebrands experience is exclusively through that hack of Counterweight and through the process of building this game with Tristan. I've never played a, a Firebrands game before other than the one we made. I come to it from a, a very different perspective uh, than Tristan, but it's one of the things that I like about our personal and working relationships together is that we come from very different places and the, the ways that those two things can meet can create some fun things. That is really neat. Why don't we flip over to setting up and we can talk about playing Firebrand's games. Setting up. In setting up, our guests will talk about an aspect of playing or facilitating Firebrand's games. And we asked Tristan and Pete what they might want to talk about. And I have to say, the idea of give and take and mutual trust is quite intriguing So let's kick off with that one. Yeah. So one of the first things that I was really impressed with, um, with Firebrands, is this kind of scripting in some of the scenes where uh, you will, as a character, say, I do this thing. What do you do? Basically, this happens Mm -hmm. with me. What do you do in response? Mm -hmm. And in a lot of those scenes, and in some very specific ones, there's this you're putting yourself in a place where the person you're asking the question of can really maybe even mess up what you had planned for your character. You're putting yourself in a position where the other person has a lot of control over what happens next. And I 
loved the idea of this mutual trust happening there where you are choosing to ask that question and hopefully at a table where you trust everyone to be responsible Mm -hmm. uh, with these questions, but you're choosing to ask that question with the full knowledge that the answer might not be something that like moves your character in forward in a way that they might want to go. That's really incredible as an idea for me. And I think for many players, it probably helps people lean into doing what's more interesting as opposed to what's going to like win them the game, quote unquote, uh, Mm -hmm. or win them the scene. That was actually something that I think really kicked off the idea that it might be a great framework for creating a racing game because of the inherent need in motorsport to trust the people you're competing against because it's a very dangerous sport. True. And uh, you have to trust that no one is going to completely drive you off the track or into a barrier or do something really dangerous that's going to put you at risk. And I thought that was just a really incredible in for uh, using the framework as a hack for motorsport racing of some kind. I'm glad you brought those things up. I think that, yeah, trust and collaboration are two things that are really important to both of us in, in making this game and in playing games in general. I mean, like Tristan said, being able to exhibit that level of trust inherent to motorsport in a play setting helped us feel like we were bringing some of that immersion to a game where you can't where you're not going to be like physically driving a car or even like seeing what the races look like or even necessarily getting results or anything like that so like to be able to have that interaction with the other people and like Tristan said the trust it was it was really important to us to be able to create an environment like that and it was really crucial that firebrands had the framework to work within that to make sure that people had trust in each other and agency over the whole story. I'd agree. I think one of the interesting things I'm finding as I explore Firebrand's games is that because there's this definite structure, you can build those permissions into the questions or the approaches to jump to Firebrand's, the original in a dance you have the opportunity to draw me close and hold me for a moment. Do you take it? It's not assumptive. It's not invasive. You have to make your character vulnerable, which I think builds a lot of mutual trust immediately. And I think that's a a fascinating approach that you couldn't have in a more, we're going to sandbox whatever you want and all the moves are to simulate the entire of existence. But Firebrands really dials in that experience I think that's a great way of putting it, Rich. And I think in particular, the decisiveness that can come with that is really useful. In our weekly TTRPG games, there's a lot of indecisiveness that happens with games that are are less structured than Firebrands. And like, we have a fun time, but those are the least fun moments, I would say, when we're trying to figure out what we want to do next for 10 minutes or whatever. Mm. Like you said, the, the structure inherent in this game and how the questions are positioned make it so that you can be decisive and that the people you're playing with can be decisive very easily. And I think that's very useful, especially when like you're picking up something that night rather than running a long running campaign to be able to just like get into it and go. Yeah, I want to piggyback off of that. I think that decisiveness is really interesting to me because there's also, I think I might have said it earlier, Firebrand's does function kind of like a script with all of these questions. Even though there's a ton of room for role-playing, it isn't as completely open as other games. And I find that script really interesting because I I think it also can help people who aren't completely comfortable really getting into character or really role-playing yet, especially new players, Mm -hmm. still participate in the storytelling and still have a stake in what happens between characters without feeling like really thrown in and unsure of what to do because they have these tools, this tool set of these questions that they can refer back to, which is another thing about playing and facilitating Firebrand's games that I think is really great. This brought up a related question. Do you find more inexperienced players struggle with that give and take? I don't think think so. I would say we've predominantly played with people who have a good amount of experience playing tabletop games, but I do think there are definitely people who have varying levels of comfortability role-playing in our group that lean into asking those questions and Mm -hmm. are totally down with just going for it. I do have a friend who I would say much prefers games like The Quiet Ear and 
firebrands, games like that, because I don't know, they have a discomfort with role playing, getting really deep into role playing. Mm -hmm. And I think the question asking is actually easier for them to have something to refer back to. We've talked about how the players in the spotlight who are sharing the game are contributing, going back and forth with questions. But what about the audience of the scene, the players who might not be on stage right now? Hmm. How do you facilitate a collaborative space? Because Firebrand's games encourage those players to ask questions about what's going on, build out some of the settings, some of the environment. That's one of my favorite things about Firebrand's games, actually, is that paragraph in most of the games that says anyone can ask for details about the setting at any time, of anyone at any time. And I think that's a way to keep players who aren't in a scene engaged, but it's also a way when you're working with a game that is a little more scripted, it's a way to really build out what's happening and that setting. And I I really love that there's this space for this kind of open-endedness to the story building within this game that has a little more structure than some other games. To bounce off that, in a session that we ran with some friends, uh, something that stands out to me, and I know we'll go into some specifics about the game later, but something that stands out to me from this particular point is we had a scene at a, a party. It was like a big event with food, and that was a situation where, sure, everyone was kind of involved in the scene, but like there were little micro conversations that were happening, and there were lots of you know questions about like what food is on the table, what decorations are there, like what is everyone wearing. Like it was a really nice way, not only to like. It, yeah, it serves the double whammy of getting everyone involved and invested in what's happening and also painting a full picture so that everyone can kind of immerse themselves fully in that environment rather than like having to do the work on their own of just imagining what they think it looks like. Since we can all build it together, then it becomes a much more tangible space in our minds. Well, that is really cool. I like the idea of the micro conversations. It sounds very party like to me. We've hinted at superstars racing icons a little bit in this segment. So let's flip over to the challenges section of the show and dig a little bit more into that game, shall we? It's the The challenge. In the challenges section of the show, our guests, or guests in this case, will discuss a Firebrands game that they've written. In this case, superstars racing icons, which... Rich could probably do a better announcer voice on, I think. Superstars racing icons! <laughs> 10 out of 10. Yeah, I wasn't <laughs> expecting the radio announcer. That was a great throwback. Pete and Tristan, what's Superstars about? What's the setting? Yeah, so Superstars Racing Icons takes the Firebrands framework and applies it to motor racing. And I use motor racing as a general term because that is how it is intended. It is not supposed to just be one specific kind of motor racing, although we were very much influenced by Formula One, which has been getting a resurgence in popularity in the States because of the Netflix docuseries Drive to Survive, which we've both seen and quite enjoyed, and we still follow the sport. So that's kind of what drove us it's a driving pun (laughs) to do this specific thing but like it's it's very open on purpose for people to take it in whatever motorsport direction they feel like it which could mean something akin to f1 or nascar indycar or motorbike racing but it could also mean pod racing at a la star wars or like any other sort of sci-fi situation could think of really like the intent is that you can build it around whatever universe and whatever setting you want it to be And I think one of the advantages of motorsport and auto racing that I have talked about to friends, little background, I'm a former sports journalist. I now work in entertainment. So I cover like movies and TV and stuff, but like I come from a sports background. And I think motorsport is one of the more accessible sports for people who don't come from a sports background because racing is as simple as it gets. It's just who finishes first, right? Like, sure, there may be other complications. There may be other things involved, but whether it's foot racing or swimming or auto racing or whatever, it's pretty easy to understand the idea that like whoever finishes first wins and the kind of drama that can come within that. So we felt like that was a good 
base to build off of and bring people in, both because of the rise in popularity of F1 um, and our affinity for it, but also in terms of the opportunities that Firebrands gave to explore the dynamics that we saw play out in real life between like teammates and rivals and these kind of narratives that kind of happen naturally in sport the drama that's inherent to those situations. So we wanted to do that in an approachable way for people, either if they're like already experienced fans and viewers, or if they're new to this and want to check it out or just explore something completely different. (laughs) That was a great answer. I I think the only thing I would add is the first line under your duties in our game says, be the best racer you can be, but remember you aren't just competitors, you are entertainment icons. Mm. And I think that is where it very much intersects with what Mobile Frame Zero Firebrands was interested in, what a lot of Firebrands games are interested in, which is you are stars in a sense. Like there's Mm -hmm. some reason why we want to follow you and there's some reason why you are connected to and or at odds with the other players who are also in some form or fashion stars. So the game is very much just as interested in the icon aspect of being a racer as it is in the sports aspect of being a racer. And and I think that is where, like Pete said, the drama inherent in sports is very interesting because it's not just how does the game end, who wins the race, uh, which is interesting enough on its own, but it's also who are the personalities behind the sport as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that, I would say that's what it's about. Also, you can kiss your teammates. Also, you can kiss other racing drivers, which is, I think, great. 10 out of 10. More sports with kissing. I love it. (laughs) What mechanics are different in Superstars Racing Icons than Mobile Frame Zero Firebrands? The biggest thing is that we don't have the specific setting that Pete was talking about. Mm-hmm. Mobile Frame Zero is is very much set in this very specific universe at this very specific time. And ours is, of course, opened up not just to different types of sports, but also to different settings, whether it's sci-fi or in the future or in the past. It's pretty open in that way. So to account for that, what we did is uh, instead of factions with leaders that you pick your traits for, we created these driver types. So these kind of personality types that you can see crop up pretty consistently over the years in sports and in motorsports specifically. So I think that's one of the biggest, like, first glance things that feels different about it. Do you, Pete, want to talk about the driver goals? Yeah, something that interested both of us from, again, Drive to Survive, the Netflix docuseries, is in the first season of the show, Netflix did not have access to the two biggest teams in the sport, which were Red Bull and Mercedes. Those teams were not interested in being a part of this because there's like a lot of access going on. They didn't want to give away their secrets, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. What ended up happening instead was that the show had to focus on everyone else. And it, it was greatly to the show's benefit because what it instead showed is that like winning the race is not the only goal that people, that teams or drivers have because it's not realistic for everyone. Only some people are able to win the races, but everyone else has their own goals. Everyone has that one team or that one driver that they're trying to beat, or they're just trying to progress over whatever they did last season or whatever it is on an individual basis. Each individual driver and team has something that they're trying to achieve coming into a season or coming into a race. So our way to try and recreate that within the the structure of our game was to have people pick driver goals and do a, a pool of tokens or coins to indicate whether they achieved it for the season. It's just kind of a way to have something to play towards partly for role playing and that kind of thing getting in the right mindset for it but also in terms of like goal setting and decision making and those kind of things that's really cool but you talk about the whole season so this is something you track over several of the for lack of a better term mini games within firebrands or how do you resolve a season one session of Superstars Racing Icons is one season of motorsport oh, racing. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's how we have it set up. I think people could play with that as they want to, but from our perspective, you can have a really fun year of racing just in one session of play. Of course, understanding that you aren't doing the racing scenes for every single race that might happen in a season. It's more mm-hmm. of a montage of the racing season in a sense. And so at the end of the game, some of the, one of the ways you close is by counting those tokens and seeing whether you achieved your goals, which could be like to get a new sponsor, to land a movie deal, to 
beat my teammate mm. to get on this great team. You know, th- those could be goals. And then you also all vote to decide who the championship winner was for that season. And then if you play the game again and keep the same characters, if you decide to do another run through of the game, that player is now the defending champion and that's their new driver type. Ah, cool. What is your favorite game and why? And I'm guessing we might have two very different answers here. (laughs) So Tristan, let's start with you. What's your favorite game? So I am a big fan. Gosh, it's the, I I feel like a nerd saying this, but it's the theater kid in me. I am a huge fan of all of the social scenes. I I love the party. I love Mm -hmm. an event with food. But I actually really love what we've done with Stealing Time together, which is a the original Firebrand scene. I think it's in quite a few of the Firebrand's hacks that I've played and read. Not just because you can kiss people in it, which I <laughs> showed my hands More kissing on. in sports! <laughs> but also, I think something that we did with it that I'm really proud of and really excited by is we created some new questions for the scene to adjust it and to provide more opportunities for a scene that could be a romantic scene or a sexy scene, but also a scene that could be an intimate scene without necessarily being about romance or sex. That could just be two people trying to spend time together and to get to know each other in a deeper way without it necessarily being about romance or sex. And I I was really proud of the way that we really worked on on that to have some really fun, I think, engaging questions that could make that scene more versatile. So I'd say that's my favorite scene. Nice. That's exciting. I like broadening out the possibilities of that particular minigame. And Pete, what's your favorite of the minigames? I do like a lot of the social scenes. Like Tristan said, I know I mentioned earlier in the episode that I had a great time doing our party scene, but I did want to mention our the free-for-all because I think the free-for-all game really appeals to me because of the involvement of everyone. Racing is a hectic sport. A lot of the times there are so many things going on at the same time, so many cars jostling it out with each other or whatever vehicle you're playing with. I really enjoyed the collaborative approach of a free-for-all and how everyone was able to get involved. So that's my short answer for the game and why, but I do enjoy pretty much all of them. Well, cool. Mentioning these games... It makes me itch a little bit to maybe try one. What do you think about jumping over here to playing the games and maybe you facilitate one for us to play? Yeah, yeah. We would love to create some drivers with y'all. That's, I think, what we would love to do together is to build those superstar relationships. That sounds fun. On your turn, pick a game. I'll run through the backgrounds that we have available. There's the gearhead, which is basically someone that comes from like a mechanic background, grew up in a garage type thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The rookie, the legacy. So, you know, someone who maybe had a a parent or a sibling or someone else who has a reputation before them. The prankster, the veteran, been around forever. The fan favorite, the defending champion, the underdog, and the bully. So a lot of these can overlap a little bit. Obviously, there are people who in real life or in fiction take up multiple of these traits, but it's just something to have as a starting place for character to build around. I'm in of a certain mood that for some reason, the way you've written up the veteran, you've been here the longest, you know how it all goes, and everyone won't stop asking you when you're going to retire. The veteran is the rich favorite. <laughs> is it? Do I, do, do I have a type? <laughs> Talked about this on mic before. Yes. It could be worse. I love a veteran. My, some of my favorite racers are veterans. <laughs> I might lean towards a fan favorite if only because I live in Toronto and that's what our local hockey team is. If they win, if they lose, no one cares. They still make a lot of money in ticket sales because people just love them. This is true, and they haven't won in a long time, so you have the data to back that up. They used to have an art installation showing off how little they've won. (laughs) Tristan, I am drawn this time to the gearhead, personally, but like as a dumb jock gearhead type. (laughs) Love it. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely love it. Gears in the brain as well. Great. I think then I will go for, I'll go for the bully. Ooh. Why not? 
All right. So in the game, as we have it written up, you pick three traits, but there's also in our fancier PDF, there's a little pop out where it has you pick two traits and then the person to your left decides your third trait for you, which makes it a little sometimes unexpected and interesting. Do you all have a preference for the way that you would like to do traits? I like the second option where someone gets to surprise me. Cool. Is everyone down with the second option? Definitely. Sick. All right. Does anyone have any strong feelings about what traits they would like to take? What two traits? I really think the fan favorite should be media savvy. Yeah. Checks out for sure. <laughs> I think the veteran has to be a good sport. Love Aww. it. Absolutely love it. I think my gearhead is going to be strong-willed. He's very confident in what he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I am going to skip over the obvious choice of aggressive for the bully, but I am going to pick fiery for the bully. I think they say a lot of things in uh, team radio that they probably <laughs> probably shouldn't say. <laughs> oh, that's good. I think to pair oddly with good sport, I will go with that uh, aggressive you left behind. Love it. I think I want to take fearless as well for the bully. I like the idea of them pushing the limits of what they can or should do on the track. I think that's fun. I'm going to go with trendy as my second one. Again, it's about that facade facing the audience rather than success or failure on the track. I'll go with shy as well. Strong-willed and shy. So now we pick for others. So since we are on a virtual table, who counts us to the left of whom? Let's do Pete picks for Rach, Rach picks for me, I pick for Rich, Rich picks for Pete. Does that work? <laughs> that was a tongue twister. I didn't expect it to be so much of a tongue twister. I know what I would like to pick for Rich, if that is cool. Go for it. I would love to pick funny. I love the idea of this veteran that just has a little bit of uh, humor, maybe some dad jokes, and the interviews always has a great <laughs> sense of humor. Everyone's laughing. The media are laughing as they talk. I, I like funny for our veteran. Okay. I accept this. <laughs> for Rach's uh, media savvy fan favorite, I think fashionable has to be the third piece here. Like, I imagine your driver has their own fashion line, always has the nicest helmet or whatever. Oh, yeah, I'm into that. Again, it's part of the package that you're trying to sell. I think for the bully, I want to go with perceptive. I don't think they're so narrow-minded that they, they aren't aware of what's going on around them. That also might be what makes them dangerous. Mm. Oh, mm. yeah, I love that. That's great. And I think for Pete's gearhead... I can't not pick loyal. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's a great choice. That filled in a lot of character gaps for me. So thank you, Rich. Awesome. So I think before we pick our name and pronouns, let's move on to our relationships with each other. On page nine, we have, along with the traits, we have a list of potential relationships you could have with someone, but it's really open-ended. It doesn't have to be any of these. We have a mentor or a mentee, a teammate, former teammate, the person you looked up to, childhood friend, rival, family member, ex, or anything else you can, you can think of that you might want to be with the driver to your right. And that would be you, right? That would be I'm me, yeah. Excellent. I think that my driver is a mentor to yours, you bully. I love it. Absolutely. The veteran, the mentor to the bully. Rach, how would you feel about being childhood friends with my driver? Oh, definitely. We could have a flashback talking about how we broke off. I think that's a dramatic moment we can examine later in play because i think there's that moment is definitely important in our characters backstories but before we were besties yes love it like we we were karting together we were doing all the tiny races when we were like seven <laughs> together yes <laughs> um and then something happened great 
So cool. So the bully is going to be the childhood friend of the fan favorite. All right. Rach, do you want to pick a relationship for you and Pete's drivers? I am going to propose that Pete's gearhead was a former teammate of my fan favorite. Perhaps you were one of the mechanics on my crew until you decide to break off and become your own driver. Incredible. (laughs) I love that. You know, I am loyal, though. So I think that, you know, at the end of the day, there's still some uh, love between former teammates. You know, it's it won't get too nasty out there on track because of the history that we have. I like it. No matter how hard the media tries to drive that storyline. Yes. Right. The media thinks we're rivals. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to share that, like, the childhood friend thing that you two just talked about is is a real thing in real life, and I enjoy it so much. The top two drivers in the sport right now were go-kart racing against each other when they were six, and there's, like, adorable footage of them yelling at each other um, (laughs) from that time. Rich, it is my turn, and I propose that your driver be the older sibling of my driver and that one of the reasons that my driver is such a gearhead is because he grew up helping your car out with like kart racing and like other stuff from an early age being involved with the garage once you went pro before me so that's that's what i'm thinking if that works for you i love that and i think maybe the veteran helped the gearhead get on the crew yes for- our fan favorite. I like yeah. that. Yeah. And one of the things I just, I love about this relationship part of building characters is that the end result is everyone has relationships to two other characters. So it's not just like a one dimensional mm-hmm. um, relationship with the other drivers in the field. There are always multiple things for you to keep in mind. And sometimes they overlap in interesting ways. Yeah, it definitely connects the entire table. I feel like everyone is very interconnected and enmeshed. Uh, in that way. All right. So next, I would say, why don't we just pick some names? We Maybe we should have done this earlier so we could have been using our characters' names. I already have what I feel like is a strong bully name in mind. So I'll just say that my bully is Lucas Pitts. <laughs> it's two T's. I didn't go too absurd. Lucas Pitts. Uh, how about they'll use they, them pronouns? I can't help myself. I have to go with the signature character of Plessy, he, him. Is Plessy a a mononym in the racing world? Sure. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) (laughs) No one remembers what his last name was. Like, it it never existed. (laughs) Family name did not exist. It's always like the Madonna of racing, guys. Exactly. Plessy, you know. (laughs) Haven't you heard of Plessy? It's all it says on his license is Plessy. He has his own line of pretzels. (laughs) <laughs> love it <laughs> I have been stuck on a Firebrands character I had made recently so I might go with Zet because mm. that's the name of my Firebrands character it's got short zippy it's to the point her pronouns are she her and I'll go with Chev C-H-E-V pronouns he him Chev and Plessy the two sibling drivers did dad name you Chevrolet? <laughs> what were your parents thinking? Listen, it's Chev, okay? <laughs> I left the role behind in middle school. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. Oh, I love I love all of these drivers already. I'm so invested in their season. So to wrap up character creation, let us finally move over to the goals page, which is page 10. And this is where we're going to pick the goal that we're working on all season. And as you will see in bold on this page, you may not pick winning the championship as your goal. That's everybody's goal. That's everybody would love to win the championship. That's not the thing we're going to focus on individually. If it happens, great. But individually, we're going to pick something like, I think I said this earlier, but like landing a movie deal, setting a lap record at a specific course, you know, something that you just really, really want to achieve this season. I could start if you want. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think this is the year that Chev finally finishes above his brother in the standings. It has never happened before at any level of racing, but you know what? His brother ain't getting any younger, and uh, now's the time. You know, Chev, 
I'm not running around the cores. <laughs> Got a car for that. <laughs> and it's pretty new. But okay. <laughs> oh, this is great drama already between the siblings. I think I am interested in starting my own team. I think the team I'm on has held me back. They don't let me push as hard as I would like to push. And I am really interested in just finding the perfect sponsor, maybe joining together with daddy's money and getting my <laughs> own my own team. I love the idea that the fan favorite has a goal of wanting to innovate a specific new vehicle part. It's a little bit a step to the left because I see options like looking for specific sponsors, trying to get a movie deal. But that idea of being an innovator and branded as an innovator, I think is very compelling. It can't be one note. You got to, you, you got to hear for a reason, right? Yeah. You're, you're here and not as in Hollywood for a reason. You get the vehicle part and then you get the sponsorship that helps you market that vehicle part. It's all about the patents. And then your name is on the vehicle part for eternity. <laughs> I think it's like having a species named after you. I think Plussy wants to start his own team. <gasps> Love it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. I think We're he plans have... on retiring and he'll lead the team. He's not going to be the driver. He hasn't told this. He hasn't announced it yet, but I think that's what's going on. Ooh, I love that. I feel like there's a lot of room for uh, Plessy and Lucas to have some conversations about maybe a new team in the works. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that is introducing the characters. That is creating them, getting them into uh, enmeshed and entangled relationships with each other, giving them some interesting and maybe unexpected traits and starting looking forward towards our goals for the season. Thanks for creating these folks with us. I really want to see them. I really want to see their season now. <laughs> oh, this was fantastic. Tristan, Pete, thank you both so much for giving us a taste of superstars, racing icons. Thank you thanks for having again. us. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. It was, it was such a great time. If our listeners want to follow more of your work online or on social media, where can they find you to? I am at Tristan B. Willis, B as in boy, Willis.com, or you can find my games at feelingfickle.itch.io. That's feeling like I'm feeling and fickle, F I C K L E. You can also find me on Twitter at feelingfickle, which I am trying to avoid because the world and Twitter is a hellscape. <laughs> Yeah, I am on Twitter, which coincidentally is where Tristan and I met, but it's the only good thing that oh. ever came out of Twitter. I'm at Twitter at Pete underscore Volk. Also, you can find my writing at Polygon.com. That is where I ply my trade as an editor and writer. Well, Pete and Tristan, thanks again for coming on Plus One Forward and being part of our Firebrand's summer series. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community Richard Rogers and Rach Schalke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aural Hotbed CD Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Drowning Attitude. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aural Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com. The next Gauntlet Community Open Gaming will be happening the weekend of September 22nd through the 25th of 2022. GCOG is the Gauntlet Gaming Community's free online tabletop RPG convention. Over the weekend, we'll be offering more than two dozen sessions with games like Twilight 2000, The Final Girl, Swords Without Master, Our Haunt, and more. All sessions are run with a set of safety tools and follow the Gauntlet Code of Conduct. Registration opens Tuesday, September 6th at 12 noon U.S. Eastern Time. We created the con to help new players get used to online play, 
showcase indie games, and introduce folks to our community. If you want to check out the event listing, go to bit.ly forward slash GCOG events all smashed together. For more details on registration and procedures, go to bit.ly gauntlet community. We hope we'll see you there.